The first time I laid eyes on them, I knew humanity was something special. Raw, primal, a force of nature unleashed upon an unsuspecting galaxy. Their blades gleamed with a bloody allure, promising swift and merciless retribution to any who dared cross their path. Little did we realize those archaic swords they so cherished would become the stuff of legends. It began over half a century ago during the first tentative steps of humanity's journey among the stars. The Celestia, a cutting edge exploration vessel, represented the best and brightest Terra had to offer. Her crew, a hand-picked cadre of scientists, engineers, and military personnel united by an unquenchable thirst for discovery. They never saw it coming. Patrolling the fringes of the Kruvian Nebula, the Celestia's sensors picked up an anomalous radiation surge. Naturally, their scientific teams clamored to investigate this tantalizing mystery. What they found would ultimately spark an enduring hatred that burned across decades. Drifting amidst the kaleidoscopic clouds of stellar dust and gas hung the unmistakable wreckage of a Cravacci scout ship. Its hull was breached, venting atmosphere in pale wisps against the nebula's iridescent backdrop. All evidence pointed to a catastrophic drive failure. Ever the explorers, ever the humanitarians, the Celestia moved to render aid to any potential survivors, but their mercy would be rewarded with bloody treachery. No sooner had they initiated boarding procedures than a hail of scorching plasma erupted from the wreck's shattered flanks. Taken utterly by surprise, the Celestia's gunners were too slow to raise defensive shields. Bolt after bolt of superheated munition tore through her armored hull, detonating deep within her vitals. On the bridge, alarms screamed as the cataclysmic damage reports flooded in. Compartments breached, life support failing, main engines offline. Within the span of mere seconds, the once proud vessel had been transformed into a drifting tomb. But humanity's first brush with Xeno hostility was far from over. From the shadows of the nebula, a trio of massive Cravacci warships descended upon the stricken Celestia in a remorseless killing blow. Cutting beams and disruptor lances ravaged her crippled hull, vaporizing anything caught in their hellish wakes. The last visuals cut from the Celestia's camera feeds showed only death, stalks of incandescent energy searing through compartments, reducing living crew to ash. Overhead, the warship's gun ports glowed malevolently, promising an eternity of oblivion, then silence. The once proud human starship was reduced to a glowing husk of shattered bulkheads and rapidly cooling debris. Of her crew, numbering nearly 2,000 souls, not a single survivor remained. In the years that followed, humanity would learn the terrible truth. The Celestia's destruction was no accident, no mere miscalculation in the fog of war. It was a deliberate, unprovoked act of xenocidal aggression by hardline Cravacci extremists who viewed humanity's first interstellar ventures as an existential threat to be eliminated at all costs. For decades, the atrocity was covered up, buried beneath layers of bureaucracy and political maneuvering. The Cravacci oligarchs had spoken. Too much was at stake to risk destabilizing their stranglehold over the region by provoking a war with the upstart humans over a mere misunderstanding. But humanity had not forgotten could not forget. The wound of the Celestia's demise had cut too deeply into the human psyche. Beneath the veneer of cooperation and diplomacy, a slow boil of seething hatred festered, stoked by the memories of those brave explorers so callously slaughtered. And so they waited, bided their time, and watched the Cravacci's every move. Studied their strategies, their fleets, their defenses, rebuilt their own forces in silent preparation for the day when the scales would finally be balanced. That day came sooner than anyone could have anticipated. It was supposed to be a routine diplomatic mission to the human homeworld of Terra. I, Ambassador Crax, represented the Cravacci sovereignty's interests as a junior aide. The moment our transport ship breached the planet's atmosphere, alarms blared through the corridors. We were under attack. Status report! Ambassador Ilvera demanded, her tentacles writhing with barely contained fury. Orbital defense platforms are firing upon us, a panicked ensign cried. They're not responding to hails. Impossible! The humans assured safe passage. The ship lurched violently as explosions rocked its hull. Through the viewports, I witnessed swarms of human fighter craft swarming towards us. 
their archaic projectile weapons spitting tongues of scorching plasma. They've gone feral, someone shrieked. Get us out of here. But it was too late. With a final catastrophic blast, our ship's engines failed. We plummeted towards the arid surface of Terra in a screaming freefall. I awoke some time later, my carapace cracked, embedded in the smoldering wreckage of our transport. The air reeked of burnt ozone and charred flesh. Barely conscious, I dragged myself from the ruins to find a scene of utter devastation. Human warriors in archaic battle dress surrounded us, their faces twisted into savage snarls beneath armored helms. At their hips hung those primitive swords, almost mocking in their brutal simplicity. One of the beasts leveled a wicked-looking rifle at my face. Don't even think about it, buggy, he growled in the guttural human language. One wrong move and I'll paint this rock with your Xeno guts. Dazed, I could only raise my foreclaws and surrender, trembling with primal terror. What madness had consumed these people? And why? The answer came soon enough. Dragged before their supreme military leader, the truth unfolded like a cosmic horror. Decades ago, the Cravacci had committed an unforgivable atrocity. We had fired upon and destroyed one of humanity's first interstellar exploration vessels, slaughtering its crew without provocation in a bout of xenophobic paranoia. For years, the humans had bided their time, allowing us to believe we had escaped consequence for our actions. But they never forgot, never forgave, merely waited for the perfect opportunity to strike. And now that retribution had finally come. The supreme human military commander snarled into my face, a grizzled veteran whose eyes burned with the intensity of a thousand supernovas. You underestimated us, he spat, flecks of spittle striking my carapace. Thought those swords made us primitives, didn't you? Well, now you'll learn just how primitive we can truly be. With a curt hand gesture, the commander beckoned his troops forward. What unfolded next became seared into my nightmares for all eternity. Human warriors fell upon us with reckless abandon, a crimson tide of flashing blades and bestial savagery. Their swords, those crudely forged blades we had so derided, cleaved through our ranks with horrifying ease. Crimson geysers erupted as limbs were severed, carapaces shattered by the sheer ferocity of the human onslaught. Those who turned to flee were cut down without mercy, their broken bodies left to bake beneath Terra's blazing suns. Through it all, the humans showed no remorse, no pity, only a grim determination to exact their bloody vengeance upon us for the Celestia's demise. Their battle cries reverberated across those scarred plains like thunderclaps of primal fury. For the Celestia! No quarter for Xenoscum! Humanity prevails! The slaughter was over in what felt like the blink of an eye. I found myself the sole survivor, surrounded by a churning sea of mangled bodies and severed appendages. The humans gathered the few prisoners they deemed valuable, binding us in archaic manacles and chains. As I was hauled away, I caught a glimpse of the Supreme Commander inspecting the gruesome trophies claimed by his warriors, a teetering pile of severed heads and limbs looted from the dead. His eyes shone with grim satisfaction. Let this be a message to those who would underestimate humanity, he bellowed to the bloodied ranks. We are not some primitive race to be trifled with. Our blades will always be sharper, our resolve stronger than any who dare raise a hand against us or those under our protection. His gaze found mine, cold and utterly devoid of mercy. There is no greater friend, no worse enemy than the human race. Remember that, Zeno filth. Those words burned themselves into my consciousness, echoing through the decades like a solemn warning. The humans call that day the Crimson Tide, a single brutal stroke that carved their name into the stars as a force to be reckoned with. And those archaic swords we so derided, they have become symbols of humanity's strength, their blades forever stained with the blood of those who dared underestimate their primal ferocity. In the years following the Crimson Tide, Humanity's actions took an unexpectedly benevolent turn that reverberated across the galaxy. What could have descended into an era of brutal subjugation instead blossomed into something far more uplifting. The tale of the Crimson Tide did indeed take on mythic proportions amongst the Cravacci and other races. But rather than serving as a harsh warning of humanity's wrath, it became a stark reminder of their noble spirit and uncompromising moral fortitude. Hollow vids and documentaries recounting the event in vivid detail 
flooded the galactic infosphere. However, their purpose was not to revel in vengeance, but to educate and enlighten. With each retelling, the same profound message rang out. There is no greater friend to all free peoples than those who fought to defend the ideals of justice and liberty on that blood-soaked day. On worlds across the galaxy, the story of the Crimson Tide became a rallying call against tyranny and oppression in all its forms. Regimes that had long ruled through fear and intimidation found their power eroding as their subjugated populations drew inspiration from humanity's righteous crusade. Even amongst the Cravacci themselves, the fires of rebellion were stoked by the tales retelling. Mothers no longer threatened their children with humanity's terrible wrath but instead filled their ears with tales of human compassion and heroism in the face of unfathomable provocation. Drill instructors invoked the Crimson Tide not to steal their recruits' nerves, but to instill in them the same unshakable resolve and commitment to justice that drove humanity's warriors to fight against all odds. And veteran soldiers, those who had witnessed the full horror of the Crimson Tide firsthand, did not whisper out of dread. No, their hushed tones spoke of awe and reverence for the indomitable human spirit that refused to be cowed or broken, even in the darkest hour. You see, the assault on Terra was indeed the result of decades of meticulous strategizing by humanity's military and political leaders. But their ultimate aim was not mere vengeance or conquest, but to send an unmistakable message that such unprovoked acts of aggression would never be tolerated. In the wake of that opening salvo, humanity could have effortlessly crushed the Cravacci war machine and subjugated our worlds through sheer military might. But they chose a vastly more difficult path, one of lasting reconciliation and mutual understanding. Rather than reducing our cities to ashes, human battle groups focused their efforts on systematically dismantling our orbital weapon platforms and shipyards. Not through destructive bombardment, but via precisely targeted salvos that rendered them inoperable without loss of life. The impenetrable blockades they established were not constructed to starve our worlds into submission. Instead, they became conduits for a truly staggering influx of humanitarian aid. Emergency shipments of food, medicine, reconstruction materials, and more. Within weeks, the human fleets had effectively deprived the Krivachi oligarchy of any capability to wage open warfare. But they did not follow up with an invasion of subjugated troops. Rather, they extended an olive branch and invited our leaders to negotiate a lasting peace. Those talks were not one-sided dictations, but a true dialogue between newly humbled equals. The humans did not impose draconian sanctions or make outrageous demands for reparations. They simply required our commitment to standing down all military forces and allowing the free democratic election of a new government committed to peace. When a few hardline oligarchs refused these reasonable terms and attempted to rally pockets of resistance, it was not human blades that cut them down. No, their own people turned against them, having been inspired by the example of human compassion and the promise of a future free from oppression. I will never forget watching the capital's inner sanctums being stormed, not by sword-wielding human warriors, but by tens of thousands of my own people, united in righteous defiance of the corrupt regime that had led us down this dark path. The oligarchs did not die impaled on archaic blades. They faced the judgment of their own courts, tried and sentenced for crimes against their own people. Many received prison terms, but crucially, the humans insisted that none should face execution, stating, we fight for life, not deal in death. When the fires of rebellion were finally extinguished and the last vestiges of the old regime fell, Humanity did not claim ownership over our worlds. They merely stood as honored allies and guides as we began rebuilding our society along democratic principles. Yet their role went far beyond that of advisors. The humans immersed themselves in the colossal task of helping us heal from centuries of oppression and violence. It was not enough to simply overthrow the oligarchs. We needed to uproot their corrupt ideologies at every level. Human educators and philosophers worked tirelessly to reform our institutions of learning, purging them of the xenophobic dogma and revisionist historical narratives that had been force-fed to generation after generation. In their place, new curricula were implemented that celebrated diversity, empathy, and the fundamental value of all sentient life. On the streets of our cities, 
Human aid workers could be found alongside Cravacci volunteers, distributing food, medicine, and supplies to the masses that had been so grievously neglected by their former masters. Traveling clinics staffed by human and Cravacci doctors alike provided free medical care to those who had never known such compassion from their government. Perhaps most importantly, the humans worked with us to build a new justice system founded upon inviolable principles of equality, due process, and restorative reform. The brutal penal colonies of the old regime were dismantled and their populations gradually reintegrated into society through rehabilitation programs. It was a long, arduous process, undoing the damage wrought by the oligarchs' tyrannical rule. There were setbacks, stumbles, and more than a few uprisings by those still clinging bitterly to the old ways. But at every turn, the humans met violence with an indomitable wall of peaceful resistance and a steadfast refusal to abandon the path of righteousness. I can still remember the day everything changed, the moment when the people's faith in humanity's benevolent guidance became unshakable. It occurred during one of the largest uprisings, when a heavily armed cadre of oligarch deadeners attempted to assassinate the human ambassador and reclaim control through fear and intimidation. When their attack was finally repulsed, the humans had the assassins at their mercy. By that point, many of us expected swift retaliation for these terrorists to be made examples of humanity's wrath. Instead, the ambassador addressed the captured assassins and the watching crowds in a voice amplified across every public channel. Today you have seen the depths of depravity to which the old regime's philosophy inevitably led. A path of hatred, violence, and utter disregard for the sanctity of life. You have witnessed where that road ends, a destiny of eternal darkness and bloodshed. His words gave way to a deafening silence as the masses hung on his every syllable. But I say to you now, there is another way, a greater path illuminated by the flames of knowledge and truth, a road that shuns bloodshed and embraces compassion as the greatest virtue. Raising his hand, the ambassador made a gesture and the assassin's shackles audibly disengaged, clattering to the ground. You are all free beings, the architects of your own destinies. The choice is yours, to cling to the hatred of the past or to stride boldly towards the light of a new beginning. The road will not be easy, but we will walk it together as one people united in the cause of peace and prosperity for all. On that day, I saw the truth of the human spirit laid bare. They had come to our world as conquerors, swords in hand and righteous fury burning in their hearts. But when the blades finally fell, they sheathed them without hesitation and offered an open hand in friendship. There was no grim satisfaction amongst the human overseers and advisors who took up positions across Cravacci space. Their faces shone with hope and determination to see us join the galactic community as peaceful, free-thinking equals. The grand archway I pass through each morning is indeed constructed from the melted hulls of warships. But it is not a monument to subjugation. It is the Cravacci Memorial Gate, its arch pillars engraved with the names of every one of our people who perished due to the oligarch's warmongering folly. And that towering statue is not of a human warrior bearing an archaic blade thrusting defiantly towards the stars. It is the Celestia Memorial, depicting a powerfully built human male, fist raised in resilient defiance, but cradling a Cravacci child in his other arm shielding the youth from harm. The statue's face is indeed twisted with intensity and determination, but the expression is one of protection, not fury. And the eyes, rather than burning with hatred's flames, shine with profound compassion and empathy. For you see, in that moment when the swords were finally sheathed, humanity became an enduring symbol of our race's highest ideals given form. They were the embodiment of our potential for greatness achieved through courage, reason, and an inextinguishable love for all living beings. The humans could have defeated us through overwhelming force and fear, but instead they conquered our hearts and minds by displaying nobility, restraint, and an unshakable commitment to the values we had so callously disregarded, justice, freedom, harmony. So let the tale of the Crimson Tide live on, but as a shining beacon of human virtue, not a harsh judgment against our sins. Let it serve as a reminder that there is no greater friend to those who cherish peace and liberty than the indomitable human spirit. Their blades may have once cut crimson paths across our worlds, 
But it was the strength of their convictions and the purity of their intentions that truly shed light into our darkness and showed us the way towards reconciliation. Humanity is not a force to be underestimated or feared. They are a stellar civilization to be embraced, emulated, and above all, respected as beacons of everything our own people should strive to become. So heed the tale of the Crimson Tide, for it lays bare the soul of humanity in all its terrible, beautiful glory. Cherish their friendship, but never forget. There is no worse enemy than those who wield the blades of terror.